Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Carmen, and I'm a training coordinator at the Temple Small Business Development Center. Um, the Temple SBDC helps small businesses start and grow. We provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling in a variety of low to no cost webinars. We are proud to be a part of the nationally accredited network of SBDCs with over a thousand centers across the United States. Welcome to the next session in our food business series. Um, a copy of today's PowerPoint and a link to the recording will be sent to all of the attendees. Um, all attendees have been muted and we encourage you to post any questions in the chat or Q and A. Um, and now I will turn the floor over to George. Thank you, Carmen. Welcome everybody on this great night. The sun is shining outside of my, uh, my window here. So um, as we always do, I actually took a quick look at some of the folks that, that popped in and registered. Some names look familiar and a couple names don't. So if you could, let's practice work in the chat now. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat icon. If you could let me know uh, which session, you know, first session, second session, so on and so forth. Just want to get a handle on, uh, on how many folks are here for the first time, especially. All right, great. And to starty, welcome. Maria, welcome. Melinda, Dawn, wow, good. Kim, I saw your name, welcome back. Shannon, thank you for coming all the time. Adam, some, some, some newbies and some regulars. Great, great. Okay, so um, for those of you folks that are on for the first time, we're gonna spend about an hour and a half tonight talking about a lot of different things, primarily cost of sales, pricing and profit. Uh, but I do have a couple of slides up front that I go through that I always go through for all the webinars. So um, let me just kick it off for those of you here for the first time. So this is the remaining schedule that we have. Uh, tonight, we're talking about cost of goods, pricing, and then next week, great session. My partner, Mark Plamondon, and Jeff Marshall will be on talking about brand identity, packaging, and advertising. So for those of you that are either developing a product, maybe you have the product developed, you're thinking about what to call it, color combinations, all that good stuff, that's a great session for you to come to. Two weeks from tonight, we have marketing, communication, social media, and influencers. It's another great session. So what we found is um, most of the, you know, most of the folks are obviously using social media to kind of get the word out. And you'll see why a lot of people are using social media. So that's a great session if you want to do that. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with Mark. We'll talk about consumer and trade promotion. So uh, there are two components when you want to sell your product at retail. One is talking directly to the consumer and the other is talking directly to the retailer. So for those of you that are thinking about selling a product or service, through another party, that'll be a great session for you. Or if you're thinking about selling direct to consumer, that's a great session as well. And then for those of you that are either you know developing a product or various stages of developing a product or thinking about a new product or a new edition, we come back on September 1st and talk about new product development. <clears throat> I don't have it on here, but on Saturday, September 11th, we have our boot camp. That's an awesome session, it's all day. Uh, in the morning, we kind of spend a good amount of time kind of going over all the sessions that you see on the screen. Then we also do some separate breakout rooms. So for those of you that are, are interested in pitching your idea in the afternoon, you come back and actually present your idea to myself, Mark, and a couple of our friends who are in the food business as well. So it's kind of like Shark Tank without the financials, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, we've had two really good sessions before. So this is the third time we're we're doing the series and you can see for those of you that are here for the first time, the sessions that you missed, uh, but we have a whole, uh, we've done this thing three times. We have a whole thing that we circle through here. So we've tried to touch on all the things you need to know to start a food business, whether it's a food retail business, a food truck, a food restaurant, selling, you know, creating and selling products. So again, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible tonight. So as I go through the slides, if you have specific questions, as Carmen said, you can go on the chat or you can go on the Q&A and, and, and uh, Carmen and uh, Sarah are gonna monitor that and kind of uh, pop in and stop me. So I'm happy to stop and answer the questions as, as great as I can. Uh, as also as Carmen said, the office hours for this session are gonna be Monday night. So if you have very specific questions and you'd like to have a deeper conversation with me, uh, I'll be online two hours Monday night. We've, I've had some really good dialogue the last uh, five or six weeks with folks. Uh, so please come on Monday night. I'm happy to spend as much time as possible with you with that. So let's get started here. 
Carmen kind of talked about the mission of Temple SBDC, but I do want to tell you all that um, tonight's session's free, all the sessions are free. And for those of you that are very, very serious about starting a business, I would suggest that you hook up with one of the advisors at Temple Small Business Development. So those resources are free as well. They can kind of help you guide you through the process. They also have a whole bunch of other webinars that might be of interest to you around business planning, uh, securing financing, so on and so forth. So I would encourage you again, if you haven't done so, to try to get connected with an advisor at Temple SBDC. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I teach food marketing at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. I've been doing that for almost 30 years. In addition to that, I spent 22 years running sales and marketing for a brand called Tasty Cake. So for those of you that are in Philly and or on the East Coast, Northeast, you may be familiar with the Tasty Cake brand. So I like to say I practice what I teach. I am not a PhD. Everything I teach is applied learning. And you'll see tonight as I go through the session, um, you know, it'll really give you a, a, you know, a 30,000 foot view of, of what you need to think about to create pricing for your product and obviously make sure you make money for your business. In addition to teaching at St. Joe's and um, uh, working for previous at Taste Cake, I actually do consulting as well. And I also am partner in a family business. So uh, I kind of cross a lot of paths here, but I would encourage all of you to take advantage of the free resources. You're going to hear me say that probably five times tonight. Take advantage of all the free resources first before you pay anybody to do anything for you. So my partner, Mark Plamon is not on the call tonight, but if you come next week, Mark's going to lead the next two sessions. And you can see Mark's background here. He has a lot of food experience. Uh, Mark and I met about 35 years ago. And for those of you that uh, remember the Tasty Cake jingle, nobody bakes a cake as tasty as a Tasty Cake. Mark was an executive vice president at the ad agency that developed that uh, slogan for me uh, many, many years ago. So Mark's got a lot of great experience in food. Currently, he runs Tandem Associates, which I'm part of, and we do outsourced marketing for a lot of different companies. So you'll meet Mark next week. So one of the things I'm really big on is, is understanding what problem you solve for the customer. You're going to hear me say that probably five times tonight. That's the essence of marketing. So first, you need to figure out who your customer is, uh, and then you need to figure out what problem you solve for them better than your competition. Really, really important. And I have a couple of examples tonight of how I think we do that. So the other thing you're going to hear me say multiple times, especially when we start talking about pricing and profit expectations, is this concept called perception is reality. So when I think of perception is reality, basically, it doesn't matter what you think people think of your business. It only matters what they think. So obviously you're going to think you have the best hot sauce or the best sliced bread or the best restaurant or the best whatever, but really people need to understand that and believe that as well. I also like to say wisdom equals age plus mistakes. So as you can see from my picture, I am an old guy. I've been doing this a long time. I've made a lot of mistakes in my 35 years of food marketing and I'm going to make a lot more mistakes. So what I like to say all the time is if you're not making mistakes, you are not trying. The key is to learn from your mistakes. So please, please, please don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to try stuff. I also like to say there's three kinds of people, people who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who wonder what happened. Now, at some point, you're going to be all three of these people in your process. Okay. So it's, you know, obviously nothing's going to happen unless you make something happen. But you need to watch what's going on around you. You need to watch your competition. You need to watch the folks you collaborate with. You need to ask really good questions. So I'm not saying you don't want to ask questions and watch. But ultimately, the key here is to implement. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about the how, which is really important. <clears throat> the other thing I think is really important is planning. So we, you know, every session that we do, you know, each of these nine modules has, has, a, has a planning component to it. So you have an overall corporate plan, strategic plan. Then you have a sales and marketing plan. You have a brand plan. You have a new product plan. Tonight, we're going to talk about pricing. So each of those uh, communications, each of those has its own planning com component. And I like to say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And what I mean by that is you have to have a roadmap. It does not have to be a 50-page plan. It could be an outline. It could be a list. But you have to have something that you believe in, 
that you're able to go back and, and look and measure. Because I like to say, if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. So it's really, really important to have a plan. And I also said the three questions. So I do like to ask questions. So what, why, and how? All of you, again, are varying stages in your process, but all of you, I'm sure, are doing reading. Whether you're doing you know, actual trade publication reading or website reading or blogs or all the above, uh, maybe you've been on some government sources, really, really important. So you're gonna have all these data sources. And the first thing you have to say is, I have this piece of data or I have this report, what does this mean? So that's my so what. The why is your opinion or your analysis or some expert's analysis of why they think that's important. But ultimately the how is the most important. How are you going to take that information and apply it to your product, your price, your promotion and your distribution, okay? So really, really important asking yourself these questions and answering the questions. This is an example of, of an overall planning process. And we call this the CEO model for customers, employees, and owners. And you'll see in the middle, we have this thing called value creation. So in order for you to be successful, you have to create value for your customers and consumers. And that value is typically what we call perceived value. So that's why I come back and say perception is reality. You'll, again, you'll see when I give you a couple of examples of how we do this, how this works. And then outside, we have the community. And outside the community, we have society. So a big part of everything that you're doing involves multiple stakeholders. And you'll see here on the right, we start with a mission and vision. Then we do an external analysis. I'll give you a really quick uh, overview of that. You have to have objectives that are quantifiable. We'll talk about that and why that's important. And then you implement your strategy. You measure your success or failure. And then you adapt and go back all over again. So this process is like a closed loop, it's a circle. I, I like to say marketing is a race with no finish line. This is an example of everything we do when we teach marketing in the classroom. This is really the only textbooky kind of slide that I have because I think it does a really good job of explaining everything we do in food marketing. So at the top, you have the five C's. Customers, company, competitors, collaborators, context. And we'll talk a lot about that. The way we create value first is understanding how to group people. We call that segmentation. Then we figure out which people are the most important people in that group. That's called target market. And then finally, once we pick the people that we want to go after, that positioning is what we want them to think and feel when they see our brand, hear our name, see our social media, maybe uh, try our products, see our stuff on the shelf, all that good stuff. From that, this is where we get to the how. Now this, if you're, for those of you that are familiar with marketing, we call it the four P's of marketing, product, price, promotion, and place. So those, that's the how, that's all the stuff that you can manipulate that you control, you control all that. But ultimately what I have circled in red is the most important thing. We have to get customers, we call that customer acquisition. We have to keep customers, we call that retention. And I would actually add another uh, box over there called development. So acquire, retain, develop. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about that tonight too. Customer acquisition, customer retention, customer development. Because if we only get customers once and they don't come back, then we're not gonna make any money, okay? That's how we make the profit. <clears throat> so the way I think about value is benefits received over burdens endured. What do I get and what do I have to go through it to get it? And again, I'll have some really clear examples for y'all as we, as we go through here. So when we start thinking about pricing, this is a quote from Warren Buffett. Hopefully all of you guys know who Warren Buffett is, Berkshire Hathaway. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Or again, the classic definition of value is benefits over cost or quality over cost. And again, when we think about this and you think about your pricing strategy, I love this quote for Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it simply enough, you don't understand it well enough. So I call this my low, lowest common denominator slide. When you think about marketing communication, when you think about really anything and everything you do to put your product on the shelf or put your product in front of consumers, you have a split second. So they need to understand what it is. 
They need to understand you know, what problem it solves for them. And then they're gonna make a decision whether they're gonna buy this or not. And think about this all the time. Benefits equal solutions to problems and solutions equal sales and most importantly, profits. So again, if you think about solving the problem of your customers and you solve the problem of your customers better than your competition, you're gonna make money for a long time. I call this my money slide, probably the most important slide in any presentation I do, which is why I call it the money slide. These are the four questions you have to answer. Who you are, what you do, how you're different, and why you're better. So if you think about this, all of you have a story. All of you are entrepreneurs. Nobody can be you. So the who you are and what you do are definitely going to be unique to you. How you're different is regardless of whether you're selling to a trade customer like a food retailer or you're selling direct to consumer, that customer and consumer is going to have some reference point when they see your product and they're going to compare you to something. So just because you're different does not make you better. They have to view you as being better. So that's the most important thing. And that's why I put what problems you solve for the customer and consumer. So for those of you that are thinking about developing and selling a product to a retailer, you have to solve the retailer's problem. And the way you solve the retailer's problem is by solving their customer's problem. So when you go make your sales presentation to Wegmans or Wawa or Whole Foods or Walmart or whoever, you have to go in and say, here's who I am. Here's my product. Here's me. Here's my story. Here's what we do. Here's how it's different than the other folks that you, you know, may be comparing us to. But most importantly, here's why we're better. So again, think back to acquisition, retention, and development. If you can go to a retailer and say, I'm going to help you get customers, I'm going to help you keep customers, and I'm going to help you develop customers, that's the language that they want to, you know, they want to hear. So one of the things we talk about when we talk about pricing is this concept called economic value proposition. So it's easier for me to show this grid to you and explain how we do this. This, this is the essence of pricing strategy. So there's two lines here, right? We have less, say more, less, say more. There's three things you give people. You can give them less of something. You can give them the same of something, or you can give them more of something. And the customer and consumer determine what is less, same, and more. And then they're going to give you less money, the same money, or more money, okay? So you, this is the bartering thing. This is the this for that, right? You're going to sell them something or try to sell them something, and they're going to either you know pay you what you're asking or not, okay? So this, is, this will be our first this chance for some interactive stuff. Can anybody give me an example from your, from your you know, consumer view of a food product that you think gives you more of something, whatever, you, however you define more, but also you pay more for that. So a food product that's more for more. Just type type the brand in the chat for me. Philly cream cheese, uh, Pedro seafood. So yeah, we'd have to know what kind of seafood, but seafood definitely costs more than other protein choices for sure. Great choice there. How about some other folks? Coffee, anybody drink coffee? Alcohol for sure to start a yes. Uh, Starbucks, Kim, thank you. People that are on pescatarian lifestyle, Dawn, great, thank you. Alcohol, so wine's an interesting one because you can go to Trader Joe's and get uh, Charles Taylor wine, two buck chuck for $2.99 for a bottle of wine. Or you can go to a wine store and spend $100 for a bottle of wine. So wine's a great one. Great one. Okay. So some good examples here. So when I think of more for more, Starbucks is a great example. Um, think of for those of you that like to go out to a really nice restaurant, however you define a really nice restaurant. So for me, uh, it's a nice steakhouse. If I go to a place like Del Frisco's or Ruth's Chris or McCormick and Schmick or Sullivan's or you know, some of those upscale chains, I know that I'm going to pay more for a piece of steak. And the more that I'm getting is not more steak. It might not even be better steak, but it's the experience in that restaurant. So it's the white tablecloth. It's a professional waiter or waitress. 
It's the ambiance, it's the experience. It might be the room or the setting and all that. So that, that's how, how I think of more for more. I could go to a store and buy a piece of steak and cook it myself for a lot less than it's gonna cost me at a steakhouse. So let's go, let's go in the opposite corner. And again, jump back on the chat. Can you give me an example of less for less in food? So you're getting less of something, however you define the less, but you know you're paying less for that something. Ramen, great answer, Adam. Yes, I love ramen. Taco Bell, Shannon, for sure. So think about Taco Bell versus Qdoba versus Chipotle as an example. All sell Mexican food, depending on your definition of Mexican food, but one's more expensive than the other. Uh, Duncan, yeah, Duncan, you're going to compare Duncan to Wawa and Starbucks. McDonald's for sure, Elisa. Yes, awesome, awesome. Some great examples. So again, think about this when you're thinking about your pricing strategy and think about how you think. And again, we need, we're going to talk a little bit about how you actually figure out your cost of sales, but think about what consumers are willing to pay for your product. So the example I'll give you here, and I'll come back and talk about this again, would be something like hot sauce. If you have a great hot sauce, you should be down here in the more for more because we already have Frank's hot sauce. We have Stubbs, we have Meckelhany, we have Tabasco. So you are not going to have as much money as these national brands to advertise. You're not going to be able to sell your product as cheaply as they sell it. So typically I tell people all the time, I like to start off in this box from a pricing strategy. You know, give people more of something, give them better quality, give them a great story, give the customer a great relationship and, and you know, customer service and all that. And see if you can get more money for your product. Because I will tell you, if you're able to go to a retailer and say, I have a premium product at a premium price, the retailer is going to listen to you because if they sell one less bottle of Frank's hot sauce, but sell Adam's hot sauce for more money, they're going to make more money, even though they're selling that same one bottle of hot sauce. Okay. So a little later, I'm going to talk to you about how retailers think and retailers mentality. And that's how you have to think when you're developing your products and pricing strategy. So let me stop there for a second. Are there any questions so far on this? I want to make sure we don't have any, any holes here. All right, great. Let's keep going. So I knew somebody was going to talk about Starbucks. So I always use coffee as an example when I talk about economic value proposition. So if you think about this, and some of you may not be familiar with Wawa if you're not from the East Coast, but Wawa is a very, very strong convenience store retailer, really up and down the East Coast now. They're really big in Florida, but primarily Northeast. Saxby's is a local coffee shop. So if you have a really good local coffee shop, that would be Saxby's. And then Panera, Dunkin', uh, McDonald's, and uh, Starbucks, these are all the national brands. So I think everybody's probably familiar with that. So think about this economic value proposition. Uh, let's assume that all of these cups of coffee are the same size. So let's say it's 20, you know, they're all 20 ounces. Starbucks is able to get more money because consumers are willing to pay more for Starbucks. They're not paying for more coffee, but in their mind, they're paying for something better. So I like to call this the badge. A lot of people like to walk around with this cup, especially my students on campus. They like to show me how important they are or status or things like that. And I tell them all the time, I can afford to drink this coffee, but I still make coffee out of a drip coffee maker, a Mr. Coffee coffee maker. I put it into a thermos or now a Yeti, a Yeti cooler, and I take it to school. Every day I drink a, you know, a 20 ounce size cup of coffee. And I can make that full 14 cup pot of coffee for significantly less, probably less than it even cost to make this cup of coffee. So that when we think about pricing strategy, let's say for regular black coffee, these guys are $2.99. These guys are probably $1.99. They're probably $1.99. They might be a little more. They might be like $2.49. These guys are 99 cents. So again, when, when you think about cost of sales and you think about how to price your product, what's actually inside the cup probably cost about the same amount of money for all these, all these brands. What's different is, again, how they package it, that's the product, how they brand it, how they communicate, where they sell it, and how they price it. 
So one of the things we're talking, we're going to talk a little bit about pricing is some people think that things that are more expensive are better. It's just perceived value. Just like these guys have a great cup of coffee. For those of you that like coffee, try this coffee. It's really, really good. The problem is they sell it for 99 cents. And the perception of a lot of people is, well, if it's 99 cents, it can't be as good as this because this is 2.99, this is 99 cents. And for those of you that are from Philadelphia, the story I tell all the time is uh, McDonald's tested Mick Cafe coffee in Philadelphia about 15 years ago. So probably about 2005. And they tested against these brands. And the problem that I, I saw at the time and I still see now is when they were launching this product, they were charging 69 cents for any size cup of coffee. And when I went into class, I'm like, okay, if it's 69 cents for 20 ounces, it can't be that good, can it? Because these guys are charging $2.99 for that. They did a blind taste test. So they, they actually did a taste test against all these brands with consumers like you. And they, they came out the number one brand from a taste standpoint. The problem, however, I say from a marketing standpoint is perception's reality. People don't buy blind, they buy brands. They're not buying blindfolded, so they have a perception of this brand, a perception of this, a perception of this, and that's what shapes their buying behavior. Same thing with pizza. Same thing with pizza. So for those of you that are lucky enough to have a you know, corner pizzeria where the pizza is made by a little fat Italian guy who looks like me with a mustache, that's the, the, like we'll call that the original pizza that came over to New York City 100 years ago. And then Pizza Hut came along and said, well, we can't do corner pizza. So we're going to do a restaurant where you're going to come in and you're going to be able to sit down and get a picture of Pepsi and a salad and your family's going to have a, be able to have a really good meal. So they differentiated against corner pizza by doing the restaurant. Then the next brand was this brand called Domino's. And Domino's came in and said, well, we, we can't do corner pizza and we can't do a restaurant. So we're going to do pizza fast, pizza hot. Again, for those of you who like Domino's, I apologize. This is I'm, I'm a corner pizzeria guy. But their difference was fast pizza delivered to your door 24-7. So they differentiated against these two, and they were able to charge for that. Little Caesars came along and did this thing called Pizza Pizza, which was buy one, get one free every day. But back then, you had to go pick it up. Papa John's came along before Papa had his problem, social media problem a couple of years ago. And Papa said, you know, we can't do this and we can't do this and we can't do this, but we're going to do better ingredients, better pizza. We're going to try to do this thing like corner pizza. So again, we're blessed in the Northeast. We have a lot of great corner pizza, you know, corner pizza shops. But if you go around the rest of the country, a lot of people view this as a really good quality pizza because they tell people we're using better ingredients and better ingredients make better pizza. And again, for those of you that want value from quantity, CeCe's does all you can eat buffet. So they charge a little more and you can eat as much as you want, but you have to eat it there. So again, think about pizza, think about coffee and think about how each of these pri does pricing and how they create value as you're creating your own pricing strategy. Two really good examples. So I talked about segmentation and here's how we segment. Here's how you figure out who your customers are. You need to understand who what, when, where, why, and how. Now, some of this you can do from observation. For, the, for those of you that already have an existing business, or maybe for those of you that are kind of testing your business concept, either going to farmer's markets or have a pop-up or might go to festivals or things like that, you're able to do your own market research without spending any money, but who, what, when, where, why, and how. Or... If you know who your competition is, go sit outside you know, their, their business or go to a grocery store or a food store and watch people shop the aisle where you think you're going to sell your product. And look at the kind of people that are walking up and down that aisle and picking those products off the shelf. <clears throat> so here's how we think about segmentation. It can be based off of behavior. So if you think of consumption in food, I think of heavy, medium, and light. So if you think of a beer drinker, a beer drinker might be somebody who drinks a case of beer a week. A medium beer drinker might be somebody that drinks a six pack a week. 
And a light beer drinker might be somebody that not doesn't drink light beer, but drinks maybe a can a week or a couple cans a month or doesn't drink at all. Okay. So that's one way to do that. If you're able to identify your, your, your customers based off of behavior, and then you can go to the retailer and say, people that buy my product are heavy users of the product. That's a great thing. The other way we do it is through benefits. Okay. Or how people think. Okay. I will call this attitudes. So people that like convenience can look totally different. You can be old or young, tall or thin, black or white, rich or poor, it doesn't matter, okay? People like convenience. People want quality, people want freshness, people want value. So these are just a couple of the ways I think about food. There's a lot more benefit segmentation. And then finally, most people are most familiar with this. So we call this demographic or geographic or descriptors. Your age, your gender, your education, your location, your ethnicity, your race, uh, how you identify, how you vote, where you live. So geography can be big city, small city, can be urban, suburban, rural, can be cold climate, hot climate, wet climate, dry climate. There's a lot of different ways we can do that. So once you put people into groups, then you figure out who you're going after and why. And I will tell you, when we, when we did our piece, uh, really heavy piece on segmentation, we talked about millennials. So people basically between the age of 24 and 40 are the new hot target market for a lot of food retailers, because they're the new young people who are just going to be coming into their own with relationships, with families, and typically families that have children, you know, pa parents that have children spend a lot of money on food. And they spend a lot more money on food at grocery stores and club stores than they do at restaurants. So that's why millennials have become real important. I'm already looking at Gen Z and that's people that are under the age of 24, because I think that's going to be the next big thing. So again, depending on how you want to segment, you want to figure out what that, you know, what you're, who you're going after. And then the positioning is what you want them to think. So again, you can target them based on how they're unique, how you describe them, how they think how they spend, their attitudes. There's a lot of different ways to do this. You can do it based on size, okay? Is the target market big? Is it a fast growing market? Is there a lot of competitors? Don't be afraid if there's a market with a lot of competitors, that means there's business there, okay? Or don't be afraid of a small market if it's very profitable. So again, this gets back to my, you know, premium product for premium price strategy. And then finally, can we do this? So for those of you that have an existing business and you're thinking about getting into something else, just make sure you can do it, that, that, you know, whatever you call it, you know, people are going to be able to, uh, to understand what it is and the concept of what you're trying to sell. So when I think of position, I, I think of these three words and positioning happens in the mind of the customer. You have to occupy a clear, distinct and desirable place in the mind of the customer. Really, really important. When I think about positioning, we write something called a positioning statement to the target market. Brand X is the frame of reference. That's the point of difference. Or the example I use all the time is to the person cleaning up the spill, bounty is the paper towel that is most absorbent. And for those of you that remember bounty's advertising, bounty's the quicker picker upper. That's been around for 50 years. 50 years that, that, that those lines have been around. So to the person cleaning up the spill, bounty is the paper towel that's most absorbent. For those of you that have seen a bounty commercial recently, whether it's on TV or social media, they still show somebody spilling something. They still show somebody picking up that spill. They show the quilts. The quilted paper towel is the difference. And that's why you're going to pay more. If you change this to, to the starving college student, you know, dollar store brand is the paper towel that is blank. It would be cheapest. So people that don't value absorbency are going to spend less money on a paper towel. Just like Scott paper towels are cheaper, Viva paper towels are cheaper, Sparkle paper towels are cheaper. They're all brands, but they're cheaper than Bounty. So the first session we talk about, which is our overall strategy session, we talk about the rules of strategy. I talk about leadership, know what business you're in, get and stay close to your customer, know who you're playing with, know who you're playing against. We also talk about, you know, don't tell anybody what you're doing. Develop your plan, go off and sell your plan, execute your plan. Seven's really important for all of you. Focus, focus, focus. So don't try to do 10 things. Try to do one or two things really well. 
And then finally, we're going to spend some time talking about pricing and profits. You have to invest time and money and sweat equity. Concentrate your resources at the point of attack. Again, don't try to spend all your money in a lot of different markets. Start off with one market or one customer and concentrate your resources there. And then finally, be mobile and advanced and secure. So you have to be able to move, which you all should because you're entrepreneurs. And then as you advance and secure space, make sure you firm that up. So don't try to come up with 15 products for customers. Come up with one and do it really well. Then come up with another one and another one and another one. When I think of consumers and pricing, I think of four things. People want, want to know, is this for me? They want to know what they're buying. Remember that Albert Einstein quote, everybody wants to save time and everybody wants a great experience. When I think of the four primary consumer drivers, I think of these four, especially in food. Saves me time, saves me money, entertains me, and is good for me. And a couple of the past sessions, we've actually had a really good dialogue around a fifth one called, is this safe for me? So think about what's happened in our world the last 18 months. And think about what's happening right now. Hopefully, we're not going to go back to where we were a year ago. But safety is really important. Personal safety, food safety. Is my, is my food safe? Am I safe getting my food? Am I safe having the food delivered to me? All those kinds of things, all right? So I probably would think about adding safety as well, but these are the four primary ones I think about all the time. So as you're thinking about your pricing strategy, if you save somebody time, you don't have to be cheaper. You can be more money. If people like your brand, you can charge more money. If people perceive your brand to be healthy, natural, organic, solves whatever, some kind of health problem, they're going to pay more for that, okay? So those are the things I think are really important from a pricing standpoint. Okay, so these are some of the questions you want to start asking yourself as you, as, as you go through uh, the process. What problem does my brand solve? So again, think about hot sauce. If you create a hot sauce, it could be hotter, it could be sweeter, it could be hot and sweet. There's a lot of different things you can do to make yourself different. Who's your ideal customer? Have an idea in your mind who the ideal customer is. When you make your presentation to the retailer, show them a picture of your customer. Know who your competition is. Remember, when you present your product to a retailer, they're going to have in their mind, whether they tell you or not, that this is going to go in the cereal aisle, the hot sauce aisle, the canned soup aisle, the barbecue sauce aisle, the pickle aisle, whatever, you know, the cupcake aisle. OK, how does your brand make customers feel? So, again, you heard me talk about um, proof of concept or test your concept. So at some point, you have to expose people to your idea or actually give them your product and ask them questions to get feedback. And again, every brand has a personality. When we do the section on brand strategy, we talk about brand personality. Is your brand fun? Is your brand serious? Is your brand aggressive? You know, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of create your brand. And then ultimately, customers and consumers have to trust you and trust your brand. So as you start thinking about this around your pricing strategy, ask yourself these questions. So remember, there's two reasons people buy something. It solves a problem, which is rational, okay? Or it makes us feel good, which is emotional. I like to think of this as needs and wants. So we need to eat food. We want Chick-fil-A. We need to drink beverages. We want Dasani water. We need a car, we buy a Honda or Hyundai or Mercedes or whatever, right? So there's basically two reasons people buy, rational and emotional. So the other concept we talk about with pricing is this concept called path to purchase, okay? <clears throat> so I wanna start off up top here and think about again, how people typically think about buying. At some point you have to identify a need. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and you plan. Now that plan may be on the fly, I'm gonna call and order food and the food's gonna to come to me. Or that plan may be, I am going to go buy ingredients, right? So I'm gonna to go to uh, ShopRite, I'm gonna buy the ingredients, I'm gonna take them home, I'm either gonna prepare them or consume them, I'm gonna evaluate, was this a great experience or not? I'm gonna engage again with that brand or not, and I go back into that circle. So again, think about for those of you that have had a bad, customer service experience or a bad experience of a restaurant. Maybe you never go back. 
Or maybe you call that restaurant or go back to that store and say, hey, I bought this product. I had a problem. What are you going to do about it? That's all this process here, right? That's all this process here. That's part of the evaluation process. So again, remember, people make mistakes all the time. It's how people respond to those mistakes. And again, your perception of whether you think people value you as a customer. So interestingly, product benefits are as likely to sway new buyers as price. There's been research done that talks about if your product or your brand solves a problem for customers better than other people, again, saves me time, entertains me, is good for me, people are going to be willing to pay that. Or people may switch from brand X to brand Y because they think you solve the problem better than somebody else. Okay, so think about that. I forgot to mention, I did see, see a, a note in the chat. Um, all of you that are registered tonight, um, Carmen and Sarah will actually give you a link or they'll, they'll actually post this presentation on the uh, SPD website. So you can go back and review this as well. I forgot to mention that earlier. So let's talk a little bit about consumer behavior, how and why consumers buy. Well, again, there's a lot of different marketing stimuli that people look at. We haven't talked about this external analysis, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but there's things like the economy that affect people, technology, political culture, your cultural background, all those things go in, okay? And you kind of push all this into all these different things here. And then there's a process. You identify a problem. You either formally or, again, not thinking about it, search for information. You check out alternatives. You make a decision. You buy and then you evaluate. Okay, that's how this that's how this thing works. And then you go back and figure out I'm going to buy this product, this brand at this store at this time, and I'm going to be willing to spend this amount of money. All right. So again, people spend different things. You know, people value time differently. If you have more time, you're probably going to buy ingredients and make your own meal. If you have less time, you're either going to buy already prepared stuff and stick it in the microwave or you're gonna buy things to kind of speed up the process. Think about pancake mix, for those of you that make pancakes. On the shelf, there is original Betty Crocker and Betty Crocker Complete. Betty Crocker Complete, literally all you have to do is add a little bit of water in there and you got it, you got it going. Okay, that's an example, we call that speed scratch. And people are willing to pay a little more for that. So here's the example I talked about, Mark talked about this in the brand section with butter. Okay, and this is perception. So on one scale, we have however you identify quality, high quality, low quality, we have low price and high price. So on the, you know, low price, low quality, and we have stick margin. Some people are willing to pay a little more for tub margarine. So even though they still think it's low quality, they're willing to pay a little more than stick margarine. Maybe it's because this protects the product better. Maybe it's because I don't have to get my hands dirty by opening up all these little, you know, things wrapped in, in wax paper and you're willing to pay a little more for that. Real butter, people are willing to pay more for real butter, probably because it's real butter. I think it's better because it tastes better and it tastes better because it has more fat. So for those of you that are familiar with the sensory experience, the reason why anything with fat tastes good is because it tastes really good in our mouth, whether it's butter, whether it's milk, whether it's ice cream. Um, potato chips, those kinds of things. And then finally, we have, we have the high price and high quality, maybe something like Kerrygold butter. Well, it has to be good. It's from Ireland. Grass-fed butter has to be good, has to be better because the cows are eating grass, they're not eating who knows what. So again, when we think of perception, this is an example, we call it a perceptual map. Same thing with cars. On one scale, I would love to have one nice enough car on the other scale, low performance, high performance. You know, no surprise, Mercedes is in a, in a class by its own and Kia is at the opposite end, okay? I drive a Honda. I'm real happy driving a Honda. I'm not a car guy. I drive a Honda. I think it's a nice enough car. It gets me from point A to point B. It's reliable. I am paying a little more money than a Hyundai, but I think it's a little more reliable than a Hyundai. That's the way I think about it. Okay. Last week, we talked about forecasting and sizing, and I mentioned this concept of external scan. So when you think about the external scan, these are things that are happening outside of your business that you can't control. Things like political, legal, economic technology. 
The SWOT analysis is internal. That's strengths and weaknesses. So that's you comparing yourself against your competition. And then opportunities and threats are external. So that's what you identify from this external scan. What are the macro trends that are going on? Okay. Again, here's an example of all the stuff that's going on outside. So we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but think about this again from a pricing standpoint. If you are concerned about your safety, you may pay more to have a product delivered to your house. You may pay more for a product that is fully cooked. You may pay more for a product that has more packaging, as an example. Okay. Um, if the economy tanks, if we have a recession, does that help you or hurt you? You know, obviously we have uh, we had a change in, in in the political landscape in January, which is going to be in place for the next couple of years. So, does having a Democratic White House, Senate, and House help you or hurt you? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Uh, are you able to leverage technology? So, even people that don't have a lot of money have a lot of technology. Not everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people have technology. So, how are you going to use technology to your advantage? What's going on in the environment? So one of the trends that we've seen for a long time is this concept around sustainability or consumers wanting to know where their product came from. So this is a great example of, in my mind, a differential advantage that you all have because you're your brand. You can create your own story. People like buying things from people that they know. People like buying things from brands that they trust. And that trust is built up over time. Okay, so this is all the stuff that's going on. And finally, legal. So this would involve licensing. This would involve for us in food, food safety, certifications, uh, business license, mercantile license, those kinds of things. So again, remember, people are motivated by needs and wants. There's things that go on outside and there's things that go on inside. And, and everything, obviously, people are crunching a lot of different different things inside here to do that. So when we think about this, for those of you that are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody has physical, physiological needs. We need food, we need water, we need sustenance to live. We need safety. You know, for us in America, you know, typically safety is I have a house, I have an apartment. I feel safe in my house or apartment or my car. <clears throat> then we have social needs. So again, think about how your world changed a year and a half ago. Think about how your world changed a couple of months ago. We were all happy to take the masks off, all happy to get back and kind of hang out with friends and family. So there's a lot of different ways we play here in food, a lot of different things in, in this process that motivate people to buy different kinds of things. And again, this is part of our pricing strategy too. People are willing to pay more for things that they value. So I like to say we're not in the food business serving people, but we are in the people business serving food. So again, you have your brand, you have your story. Nobody can copy that. Nobody can copy that. And I always think even though we're becoming a much more technologically based society, I always think there's going to be room for great relationships and there's definitely going to be room for experience. However, customers define experience, always going to be room for that. <clears throat> so when you think about retail, if you're thinking about opening your own store or if you're thinking about selling your store to a retailer, here's how retailers think. People go to the store, it's called that traffic, and they buy something, okay? They pay something for that box or bag or package, and they make a certain number of trips, okay? So we call, every time you go to the store, that's called a trip. Every time you buy something, that's called a, you know, that's traffic and transaction. So when you multiply dollars per unit times units per trip, that gives you dollars per trip. You multiply dollars per trip times trips per household. So one of the measures we look at in the United States are households. Households can be 16 people. Households can be one person. A household is a household. Could be an apartment, could be a home. That gives us the buying rate. We multiply the buying rate times the number of households, and that's how we create dollars. So this is the lingo that, again, retailers think about. 
Retailers also think about these three concepts called basket size, loyalty, and frequency. I'll start with frequency. If you can explain to the retailer that having your product on the shelf will get people to come back more often, that's a great thing. They like that. If you can explain to retailers that they will be loyal to that store because your product is in that store, maybe your product's not sold in a lot of other stores yet, they like that. And then finally, if you can go to the retailer and say, when my product is in the shopping cart, people also buy X, Y, and Z. That's called basket size. So one of the measures that retailers look at is average basket size. How much is in that shopping cart every time somebody comes to the store? So again, this is the lingo that you want to think about the way retailers think is basket size, loyalty, frequency. If you're thinking about creating your own company or your own retail brand, you have to think the same way. Can I get people to come back often? Can I get people to come just to me or come to me more frequently? And what can I sell? How can I merchandise? How can I price my products so that more things go in the shopping cart? And again, remember back to my acquire, retain, and develop. So as you start thinking about sales channels, there's basically you know, a couple of different ways you can do it. You can do it yourself by either creating, opening your own bricks and mortar store, maybe a pop-up, maybe a farmer's market or something like that. You can certainly sell direct to consumer online. You don't even need to have a storefront. But you can also sell to specialty stores, which many of you probably, the, a lot of the products I, I've heard over the last couple of weeks might be specialty products. Or again, many of you are obviously most comfortable or most familiar with the large chains. So there's a lot of different ways you can sell your product. And by the way, within each of these different channels, there's a lot of different ways you can price your product as well. So let me give you an example of how retailers create value through their pricing strategies. This is how the retailer thinks. So for those of you that are looking at this picture, just go on the chat and tell me which one you would buy. You don't have to tell me why. Just put left or right in the chat. Chicken on the left, chicken on the right. All right, Ayana, I like your answer. Right because it looks healthier. Adam, you're a vegan. All right, you don't count. Not in this one, you don't count. So typically when I show this to my students, and again, most of them are young, a lot more people pick this one than this one. And what I tell them is when I was in college a million years ago, all of us would have picked this. So the reason all of us would have picked this 35 years ago is this is a Purdue chicken. And 35 years ago, Purdue told us that this was a healthy chicken and this was a tired chicken. And the way Purdue got the chicken to look yellow 35 years ago was they fed them marigold flowers. So the feed that the chicken ate was basically yellow flowers and that kind of gave it the yellow skin. And Frank Purdue was able to take chicken from a commodity and charge more for this because it was yellow. Today, this looks like a healthier chicken because it doesn't look yellow. It's not as big, probably doesn't have steroids, probably doesn't have antibiotics. So back on the perception, perception 1980 would be here. Perception 2021 is here. All right, so let's go to this next picture. Let's assume that you are buying a fresh chicken that looks like this. And I'm not gonna tell you whether it's natural or organic. Uh, tell me what you would be willing to pay per pound. So typically when we buy commodities in a grocery store, or buy protein in a grocery store, we pay a price per pound. So what do you think most people pay per pound for a whole? raw chicken. Just type it in the chat. Dollar fifty, dollar three fifty. All right, all good answers. So let's just say for my argument here, it's going to be 99 cents a pound. Kim, $15 a pound, I, I want you to buy my chicken. Wow. All right. So let's say that the, the average retailer thinks that consumers are willing to spend 99 cents per pound for this chicken. Here's how we create value through pricing. 
Most people don't want to take that chicken home and do this. So retailers say, okay, if you still want the raw chicken, we'll cut it up and we'll sell you all these parts. Two legs, two thighs, two breasts, two wings. But we're going to charge you $1.99 a pound. So for us to cut this chicken and get rid of all this blood and guts and all this other stuff, now we're going to charge you $1.99 a pound. And a lot of people are going to say, hey, I will pay $1.99 a pound so that I don't have to cut that chicken up. But then some people say, hey, you know what? I just like legs. I just like breasts. I just like wings. I just like thighs. For me, I still can't figure out why chicken wings are the most expensive price per pound because there's not a lot of meat on there. I don't know what it is. Obviously, they taste really good. I get that. But so people are willing to pay more per pound for just one thing, more than this. Okay. If you go to a club store, people buy, you know, they pay more and the more they're paying for is not quality, it's quantity. You're getting more of something in a club store. So maybe this is like, you know, $2.99 a pound. Some people like chicken breast, but they don't, and they like it thin, but they don't like the slices. So Burdu has created thin sliced chicken breast. This might be $3.99 a pound. It's still the same chicken. It's still that, but because somebody's taking a knife to it, and we're cutting it thin and we're putting little papers in between, we're gonna charge $3.99 a pound. Or there's smaller households, portion control. Now we're gonna individually wrap these. Oh, and by the way, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put a little marinade on them too. Okay, individually wrapped and marinated. So for this, maybe people will want to pay, pay $3.99 a pound. Some people like to get it at the butcher, custom cuts. They might pay $4.99 a pound here. Or if you have a, you know, a, a retailer that has a little food area, prepared foods area, they're probably going to pay $8.99 a pound for chicken here or $9.99 a pound. So again, think about that. We took a commodity, 99 cents a pound, and when we get all the way down here, we're able to get $8.99 a pound for it. That's pricing strategy. That's pricing by creating value add however you define value add. So that's a really important concept for you all to think about and understand as we, as we go through this. How do restaurants create value? Let's talk about restaurants, okay? So we had McDonald's before. Again, one, this, is, this is McDonald's, Burger King, or Wendy's. I'm not sure which is which. Anybody know what this one is here? Jump on the chat. What brand is that? Right here, row four and five. Thank you, Destardi. Anybody know? What do, you, what do you guys pay for this? Does anybody know how much like eight nuggets cost at, at Chick-fil-A? Not KFC, Andy. Good guess. Not KFC. Kind of looks like KFC, but that's definitely Chick-fil-A. So no, nobody knows how much Chick-fil-A costs. They just like it. And they're willing to pay a lot more for this than they are for this, this, or this. It's made with chicken. It's chunked chicken. But people are willing to pay more for this. Okay, Annie, you've never been to Chick-fil-A. You got to go, got to go to Chick-fil-A. So again, this is pricing strategy. These guys have a problem getting off of 99 cents. They've conditioned consumers to pay 99 cents for chicken nuggets. That's their value. They create their value off of price. These guys create their value off of something other than price, whether it's experience, whether it's taste, whether it's appearance, the whole Chick-fil-A experience, whatever it is, okay? These people are getting a lot more money by, by saying, my pleasure. All right. Any questions there before I get into pricing and profits? All right, doing a time check here. All right, great. We have about a half an hour left. So for those of you that are not familiar with an income statement, this is an example of an income statement. And this would be, this is taken right out of a, you know, publicly traded food company's uh, annual report. So you can see here, we start off with sales and then we have this thing called cost and expenses, cost of sales or cost of product sold. So for us in food, this is everything it takes to go into making that product, cost of product sold. So it's the raw materials, it's the labor, it's the packaging, it's all that stuff that goes into that. 
Then we have marketing expenses. We have administrative expenses. We have R&D. We have other. So most of you are probably not going to have an income statement this intricate, but I wanted to show you how big companies think about this and how they figure out how they're going to you know, make money or not. So what happens is we start off with revenue. We have all these expenses. Then we have taxes. And this is our profit. So even though this is a $7.8 billion company, they literally only made, uh, I'm sorry, they, they made uh, $854,000. So after all their expenses, they went from $8 billion to basically $854 million. Still a lot of money, but certainly like a lot less than that. That's probably you know close to about 10%. So again, if you think about this for you, you know, this is probably a pretty good ratio. If you sell something for a dollar, you're probably going to make about 10 cents profit. So you have to sell a lot of stuff for a dollar, right? That's how you want to think about pricing. So when we talk about price, okay, it's the assignment of value or the amount people are willing to pay for the exchange of your product. That's how you want to think about price. There's a lot of different ways, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but there's a lot of different ways we think about price planning. Okay, so your pricing objectives can be based on profit. Maybe you say, I need to make $50,000 to live. I need to make $20,000 to live. I need to make $500 a week to pay my mortgage or my bills or whatever. There's a lot of different ways you can think about this. Okay, you can also think about it based off of sales. You can think about it based off of market share. I'd like to get 10% of the market. Um, you can think about, you know, how do you estimate demand? So an example, think about a product that's a seasonal product, okay? Whether it's uh, something like water ice in the Northeast, we sell a lot of water ice in the Northeast, you know, from May through September. Nobody's buying a lot of water ice in January. Not, not a lot of people are buying a lot of ice cream, although ice cream's a year-round product. You know, I think people drink uh, more beer in the summer than the winter, except for Super Bowl, except for, you know, New Year's Eve, those kinds of things. So we have to figure out how we're going to estimate demand. Then we have to figure out our costs. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of how you want to think about the cost. So we have something called variable cost. And a variable cost is something that changes with each package or unit. Fixed costs don't change. So when you think of thick fixed costs, think of rent, think of utilities, think of taxes, think of manager salary. So again, if you're going to open a store or open a business, you have to pay rent, you have to pay your utilities, you have to pay your taxes, whether you sell one thing or a million things. Now, if you're making things, the more stuff you make, the more people you need. The more stuff you make, the more ingredients you need. That's why that's called a variable cost. And I'm going to show you how to calculate your break-even in a minute, but break-even analysis is really important, really, really important. So again, as we think about the pricing environment, a lot of things go into that, the economy, the competition, the government, consumer trends. You know, most of you are probably not gonna be worried about the international environment. Although I will tell you, a lot of the packaging materials we get in the United States come from outside the country. So packaging is an issue right now. Parts, for those of you that have bought a car or trying to get something fixed, a lot of parts come from overseas. So that would be an example outside of food, okay? When you think about your pricing strategy, there's a couple of ways we can do it. You can do it based on cost. You can do it based on demand. You can do it based on the competition, the customers. There's a lot of different ways we can do that. And I'll give you a couple of examples from that as well, okay? And then the tactics. So the strategy is kind of like the roadmap. The tactics are things you can do specific to products for multiple products, maybe based on different uh, retailers or different channels of distribution, and maybe give different people different discounts. That would be an example of tactics. So again, we talk about objectives based on cost, demand, the environment, or revenue. So here's an example. This has nothing to do with food, but variable costs at different levels. Okay, this happens to be a bookcase example. So if we make 100 bookcases, the wood cost is $13.25 per bookcase. If we make 200 bookcases, the wood cost is the same amount of money. But if we go up to 500, <coughs> we, because we can buy a lot more wood, we're able to buy the wood cheaper. Same thing with the nails. You know, we might be able to get the nails a little cheaper. We might be able to get the paint a little cheaper. Um, so notice the labor. The labor is the same. It's $12 an hour. 
But if we're making 500 bookcases, maybe we get better at making the bookcases. So it costs us a couple bucks less to do that. So you'll see the cost per unit's a little cheaper for a larger quantity. And then here's an example of how, how you might be able to compare costs. So these are variable costs. All these things change with the level of products that you make. So break even is when you're able to identify how much you make and how much you sell. And that's where, so that's where profits and revenue equal. That's called the break even. I'll be able to explain that a little easier in a minute here. You take your total fixed cost and then your contribution per unit. So this would be, we call this the gross profit margin. So think of a lemonade stand and you're gonna set up and sell lemonade outside your house. So it costs you a uh, dollar, right? You're gonna, I'm sorry, you're gonna charge a dollar for the lemonade <coughs> and all of your costs for the cup, for the lemonade, for the labor, for whatever are, let's say 50 cents. So your contribution per unit is 50 cents or 50%. So that means that if your fixed cost, so you had to buy a table, you had to buy a sign, you had to buy a couple of other things that you, you, know, you needed to set up. Let's say your fixed costs are $5 and you make 50 cents on every glass of lemonade you sell. So you divide five by 50 and you come up with 10. So you have to sell $10 of lemonade to break even. That's how you think about it, okay? So that's, again, really important concept for you to understand. So that's why you need to understand what it costs you to make a product. And then you also have to figure out what it costs you to get that product from where you make it to where you're gonna sell it. And I'll give you an example on that in a minute. So we have this concept called markup, okay? This is the amount added to the cost at each channel member's piece. And it'll be easier for me to explain it to you this way, okay? Actually, let me, let me go through this quickly because this is really this is really important setup here. Psychological issues in pricing. So people have expectations of what they're gonna pay for something. People have reference points. And then people also make price quality inferences. So again, think about this. You're not going to expect to pay a lot of money for a chicken nugget at McDonald's. You're probably gonna to expect to pay a little more for that chicken nugget at KFC. You're gonna spend a little more for that chicken nugget at Chick-fil-A. You're gonna spend a little more for that chicken nugget at Applebee's or some sit down restaurant, right? So people have different expectations, reference points, and again, price quality inferences. So let me take you through an example of, of a company that I did some work for a few years ago. It's called Elizabeth Lane. And they are a company that does simmer sauce. So they were creating simmer sauce. And this is basically a 16 ounce jar of sauce that you would mix with a pound of protein, whether it's chicken, fish, pork, beef, turkey. So they wanted to sell this product to grocery stores, which we thought was a mistake, but that was, you know, that's who they wanted to sell it to. So if you think of something like simmer sauce and who might use something that they're gonna actually mix with a pound of protein and cook for a half an hour, you have an image in your mind of who that customer might be. Who are the competitors? Well, maybe the competitors are barbecue sauce, marinades, salad dressings, pasta sauce. The other thing we had to talk to them about was, is this shelf stable or perishable? Because that's gonna go in two different areas of the store. They were currently making it in their, you know, in their backyard, but they had to go to a commercial kitchen and then they ultimately went to a co-packer. And that's somebody who is a larger scale producer who can make a lot of something. And the reason why you would go from a commercial, you know, go from your own kitchen to a commercial kitchen to a co-packer is scale. So co-packers can make a lot of stuff a lot cheaper than you can in your house or a commercial kitchen. Where are you selling it, local or national? How are you selling it? Are you gonna sell it directly to the store? Probably not. Are you gonna use a wholesaler? Maybe. Are you gonna sell it in retail? Maybe. Where is it gonna go in the store? How are you gonna get it to the store? So these are all things you need to think about. So this is how grocery stores think. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but this is literally a report that grocery stores look at every week. So grocery stores think in terms of departments. Grocery is basically everything in the center store. 
We have dairy, we have meat, we have produce, frozen deli. So I think all of you are familiar with this, those of you that have been in a grocery store. Habas Health and Beauty Aids. So grocery stores know what this represents. So you can see grocery represents the biggest part of sales for a grocery store. On a percentage basis, it's 40%. The grocery stores also know how much it costs for all that stuff they sell. You know, this would be rice and cereal and uh, soup, uh, uh, beans, baby food, diapers, paper towels, all that stuff. So they know what it costs and they subtract what they collect, the sales minus what they pay, and that's called gross profit dollars. Okay, so 400 minus 303 equals $97,000. And then they divide this number, 97,000, divided by that, and that's how they figure out that their gross profit margin is 24%. So even though they are selling, collecting $400,000 from customers, they're actually only making $97,000 gross profit. But then they also have to worry about shrink, and that's that stuff that's unaccounted for. They have to worry about payroll because they have to pay people in that department. So really, they're not making $97,000. They're making $86,000. So now it goes from 24% to 21%. So again, if you think back to my break even, okay, they have to sell a lot to make 21%. And again, if you look at these different departments, let's take one that's really high profit. Produce. So they make 36.8% contribution, like net profit off of produce, even though produce only represents $81,000 in sales. So produce is a lot smaller than the grocery department, but a lot more profitable than the grocery department. And if you think about some retailers and how they differentiate, retailers differentiate off of produce because that's something that people value and people are willing to pay more money for. So again, think about this. These are the departments that, that stores think about. And then within each of these departments, there's categories. So that's the mindset of the retailer. But this is basically how a retailer thinks about how they make money. Okay, and I'm going to skip this. But in the PowerPoint, I actually have it ranked off of, it's all the same numbers. One's ranked by dollar sales. One's ranked by profit margin. Okay. One is ranked by profit dollars. So over here, right? And I like to say, we don't take margins to the bank, we take dollars to the bank, all right? So dollars are really important. And then the others ranked on contribution margin. So again, all things being equal, if a store was looking at this data, they'd say, well, gee, I'd rather, if, if I'm gonna give more space to something, I'd give more space to produce because they make more money on that. I don't make any money on the pharmacy. I don't make a lot of money on food service. I don't like make a lot of money in health and beauty aids. Um, seafood's okay, but because we throw a lot of the seafood out, look at the shrink here. Seafood, you know, 8% of everything that goes in the seafood department gets thrown out because people can't sell it. So this is the mentality of the retailer. This is how the retailer thinks about their pricing strategy. All right. Now, this is really important for those of you that are thinking about either creating a retail store or selling to a retailer. <clears throat> and I use $10 as the example because it's easier for us to understand. The retailer is going to sell something for to consumers for $10. That's the retail price. But the retailer has a profit expectation. The retailer needs to make 30% profit. So you need to sell that product to the retailer for $7 for them to sell it to the consumer for $10. Most of you are going to use a wholesaler or distributor to get your product to the market. So that's somebody who takes title to your product and then takes your product from wherever you make it to the retailer. Well, they need to make money too. So they're, they're expecting to make 30% profit margin. Now they make their 30% off of the $7. So that's why they're going to pay $4.90. They're going to sell it for $7. The retailer is going to sell it to you for 10 some of you may have may need somebody called a broker. And a broker is somebody who represents you to the retailer. They represent, you know, they sell a lot of different product lines. The broker has a great relationship with the retailer. Well, they need 5%. And they're making their 5% off of um, the cost of the retailer. So that's how we get to the 35%. 
okay? So now we went from you selling it for $7 to the retailer to you selling it for $4.55. This is where you start. So this would be where you start your revenue. Let's assume that it costs you about $3 to make that product. And again, I just use this as a ballpark. So an average cost of sales for many food products is about 30%. So that's where I came up with $3. So this is your gross profit. And then you need to figure out what your fixed costs are. You need to figure out what your earnings before interest and taxes are. So you take this number minus your fixed cost. You come up with earnings before interest and taxes. Everybody has to pay taxes. And then this is your net income. So I can't, I can't fill these in here, but typically I will tell you that this net income is close to that 10% number. So this is like a dollar. So even though somebody's paying $10 to the retailer, you're probably making about 10% after, after you take all of your expenses out. Okay. So that's, again, this is a very, basic income statement, but this would be where I would tell you to start from a pricing strategy standpoint. So here's, I call this my back of the envelope experience. <clears throat> For those of you that are interested in opening a restaurant, let's say we're going to open Latella's Kitchen. And let's say that um, you think, you have no idea, but you think you can sell $500 a day worth of stuff. So in a week, you would sell, if you're open seven days, you sell $3,500. If you're able to sell a thousand a day, well, now you're selling 7,000, so so on and so forth. So you can see as we kind of go up here, you know, we, this is part of what we talk about our market sizing and gap analysis. Just start off with some assumptions. Now, as I said before, the cost of sales, in this case, I made it about 40%. Usually it's a little less than that, but I wanted to make it a little higher. So, so re, depending on how much you sell, that's going to, this number is going to be adjusted, okay? And then you can figure out, okay, well, this is probably a bad number now because nobody's working for 10 bucks an hour. But if you have two people making stuff and you have a 12 hour shift and you're paying $10 an hour, seven days a week, well, here's your labor rate. Okay. You're going to pay this if you're open 12 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to pay this whether you sell anything or not. So if you notice the labor stays the same, but look at what happens to the profit. So if you're able to go from $500 a day to $1,000 a day, look how much the profit jumps. So this would be an example of how you start with your break-even analysis. And then you could talk about, again, prepared foods. You could talk about maybe selling some branded food, you know, Coca-Cola, hers. So this would be if you're opening your own retail store. You're going to make less profit on that. So you're going to pay a higher amount for something from Coke or hers or Dietz and Watson because it's already prepared. You don't have to do anything to it. Here, you have to buy raw materials, you have to cook them, you have to wrap them, you have to package them. Here, it's already coming in free package. So you're going to make less profit margin, okay? But you also have no labor. It's literally this product comes in the store, you put it on the shelf, and you make complete, you know, full profit on that, okay? So then, you know, I did the same thing for catering, if you're thinking about the catering business. And then I added all these up. So if we did prepared foods, and we did branded food, and we did some catering, we add all those up, and we're going to do $5,600 a week, uh, $1,100 a week, you know, depending on what we're doing. Here's the food cost, here's the labor, here's the gross profit. And then I kind of took a shot at, and all of you can do this, so these would basically be the expenses that I think all of you are going to have if you start a business. You know, you could be the manager, but you have to pay a manager. And don't forget, if you're going to be the manager, pay yourself. Make sure that when you do your ballpark financials, that you put money in for yourself. Profit is not a dirty word. You have to live. Make sure you account for yourself in here somewhere. Okay? Maybe you need a manager, an assistant manager. You need cable, internet, phone. Maybe you need a security system. If you're cooking food, you're probably going to need some you know, maintenance or grease trap or something like that. You definitely need business insurance. You definitely need workman's comp insurance. You're probably going to pay rent. You're going to pay utilities. You definitely need to have some kind of marketing budget. So again, hypothetically, before I sell anything in Latella's kitchen, every week, I'm going to have $2,325 in costs to pay for all these people, whether I sell one thing or a million things. I also have payroll taxes, which is about 8%. 
Okay. So based on, you know, based on the numbers up here, I'm going to have to pay 8% payroll tax. And then I kind of stopped here. Here's my profit before income taxes. So again, in this case, if I'm only selling $5,600 a week, I'm losing money. If I'm able to get to $11,500 a week, wow, I'm actually making one, you know, $1,400. So again, you can see the difference here between, and again, obviously it's a big jump going from 56 to 11, but maybe you do 56, 6,000, 6,500, 7,000. This is really easy to do in a spreadsheet. If you don't know how to use an Excel spreadsheet, you can teach yourself pretty quick how to do that. So again, remember the customer and consumer determine who makes money. Profit is the outcome of satisfying customer and consumer needs and wants better than your competition. So let me stop there. Let me go back here. Do we have any questions from anybody? Please, now, now's the time to ask questions. We got about 10 minutes left before I do the wrap up. Any specific questions on pricing? Uh, just to interrupt really quick, yes. sorry. Um, we are gonna post a survey link in the chat. It takes less than a minute um, about today's webinar. We value our, all of your guys' feedback. Um, this is not um, necessary by all of you guys, but it is required by our funders, the Small Businesses Administration, so we can continue offering no-cost workshops to you guys. All right, so we just had a question to put the spreadsheet back up. And again, for those of you that are interested, this presentation will be posted through a link on the SBD website. So again, I, I wanted to try to give everybody, I know some of you are at different stages in, in the process. Uh, obviously, if you get big enough, get yourself an accountant, get yourself a bookkeeper. It's worth the money. Uh, I spoke with somebody earlier today about QuickBooks. If you're interested in setting your own accounting system up, QuickBooks is pretty, in, you know, in, uh, 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 not cheap, but cheap relative to, you know, what you're paying for what you get uh, on that. So let me do the wrap up here. And then again, we'll come back and, and talk about, you know, maybe some quick Q&A. Um, so some key points to remember. So here's your scorecard. Where are you now? Try to understand where you're now, where you want to go and when. Remember planning, right? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. How do you determine success? Again, for those of you that are thinking about quitting your job and starting a business, you're going to have a whole different objective than somebody who's going to be starting a side business. Or maybe somebody's going to do some testing of their business concept, we call it, right? There's a lot less risk in testing your business concept than basically remortgaging your house or borrowing money from friends and family and starting a business. So understand that, um, how you determine success. Please don't forget perceptions of reality. Really, really important. We talk about pricing. Think about what we talked about with the economic value proposition. And again, think about where you fit. I typically tell people, start here. It's a lot easier to go from you know more for more to more for same or same for less than it is to start off. You know, you're never going to be able to go from less for less for more for more. McDonald's is never going to be able to charge four bucks for a cup of coffee like Starbucks. So <clears throat> McDonald's has to sell a lot more coffee than Starbucks to make the same amount of money. That's how I think about that. Understand how to segment. Again, we talked about segmenting based off behavior, based off of benefits, based off of descriptors. Figure out who your target market or markets are. I mentioned millennials being really hot. You don't have to go after millennials. But if you think your product's interesting to millennials, retailers will listen to you. And again, think about how you position your product. When people see your brand, see your package, see you, hear your story, what do they think? Don't forget the money slide, probably the most important slide tonight. Who you are, what you do how you're different, why you're better, and the why you're better is what problems you solve better than the competition for your customers and consumers. And remember, again, as you start thinking about pricing, there's no longer markets for goods and services that everybody likes a little. There's only a couple of Coke and Pepsis. You can't be Coke or Pepsi. But there's always going to be markets for goods and services that somebody likes a lot. We call that a niche product. So again, these, these are uh, just kind of like the outlines and the different things we're going to go through. I want to kind of jump to next week to show you what we're doing there. So again, <clears throat> for those of you that are interested, next week we'll talk about brand identity. We'll talk about packaging. Jeff has a really good, Jeff Marshall has a really good example of kind of like before and after packaging he's worked on, before and after logos he's worked on, all that kind of stuff. 
And then we'll talk next week a little bit about brand identity through channels and marketing communication. But then the following week, we talk a lot about marketing communication, pros and cons of social media. And for those of you that aren't familiar with paid, owned, and earned media, you'll understand, you know, if you sit through this session, you'll understand why things happen on your social media feeds, why you're getting ads, why maybe your friends are getting different ads, all that good stuff. So the next couple of weeks really center around brand and communication. In three weeks, I'll be back to talk about, again, create and retain customers through consumer promotion, and trade promotion. And we'll talk a lot about these terms, again, acquisition, retention, development. And then in a month, we'll talk about new product development. So how do you create new products, attributes and benefits? We'll talk about packaging. We'll talk about recipes. We'll talk a little bit about food science. I am not a food scientist, but I, you know, I, I know enough to kind of talk about that. And then we'll kind of talk about how do you manage a new product, a new development process. And again, as I said, for those of you that are interested, on September 11th, we have our boot camp. So if you're thinking about pitching your concept or if you have a full-blown presentation, you know, in the morning, we're going to spend time talking to you all about that. And in the afternoon, you're all welcome to sit in and watch everybody present their product. So again, I kind of mentioned before, this is like Shark Tank without the financials. Really, really good session. And this is a no risk session. So again, for those of you that have an idea, this is your chance to kind of share and get some feedback, okay? So again, these are the dates that we have going on here. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Carmen and Sarah to wrap us up. Okay, thank you, George. Um, so just as a final reminder, our team is offering office hours to answer your individual questions. Um, this was originally tomorrow, but we switched it to Monday, August 9th from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, I'm posting a link in the chat so you can use this link at any time. You don't need to register. Um, and as a final note, we really value your feedback. Um, so if you have an extra moment, the link above the one I just posted is a quick survey, less than a minute. If you guys could fill it out, um, we really would appreciate it. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Have a great day. Have a great night, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you Monday night. Great. And then Carmen, as the host, if you just click end, it'll end the session for us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Good night, great everyone. Job, Carmen. Thank you.